Welcome to the Mark Steiner Show and another edition of Rise of the Right here on The Real News. I'm Mark Steiner, and it's great to have you all with us. Now, one of the keys to the rising power of the right is its ability to organize, a tradition that once belonged to us, and to strategically build power from the bottom up, to tactically take power locally, to build their power regionally and nationally. And we can also see a little bit of what's in store for us if they do win power when you look at some local examples. One prime example is the reality that's in Northern California, in Shasta County, a beautiful county that hides a dark secret. Sasha Abramsky is an author and activist who frequently writes for The Nation. He wrote an important article for them entitled The Takeover of Shasta County, asking the question, is this the blueprint for the right nationally? It's eye-opening, and I would say frightening, a frightening warning of what could be and what do we do to stop it. Now, as I said, Shasta County is one of the most beautiful places on earth. I've been to it many times, but within that beauty of its landscape lurks an authoritarian right-wing movement masking itself as a true democratic movement and as a threat to its future and our future. So in this episode of Rise of the Right, we talk with Sasha Abramsky, who wrote the article. And we talk with one of the people he highlights in that article, Donnie Chamberlain. She's a progressive activist and journalist facing death threats and has taken on the right in Shasta County. Sasha Abramsky is a regular contributor to The Nation magazine. He's been covering the growing power of the right wing in America's local worlds. As author of numerous books like Inside Obama's Brain, The American Way of Poverty, The House of 20,000 Books, Jumping at Shadows, and most recently, Little Wonder, The Fabulous Story of Lottie Dodd, the world's first female sports superstar. Now, he outlines in this conversation, he details and explains how the right wing took over Shasta County, how this is a very real possibility, emblematic of what our entire nation faces. Here's that conversation. So, Sasha, welcome. It's good to talk to you again. It's good to be back, Mark. So this article that you wrote, the, the one we just introduced about Shasta County, I, I'm, I'm curious, just, just very quickly, how you came to this story in the first place. Well, I've been doing a lot of stories um, over the last couple of years about counties and cities that for various reasons have sort of swung far rightward, um, not just in the Trump era, but more especially after the Trump era. And I had been following what was happening in Shasta because there'd been this recall election in the winter of 2022. I think it was February of 2022. And I sort of mentioned it to my editors at the time, and it got kind of a lot of national attention back in February 22. And I said, look, you know, I'm your California Western correspondent. Why don't you let me do a story exploring what's happening in Shasta? And so sort of I got a yes in the abstract, and I put it on the back burner because I had all these other features I was working on. And basically we were brainstorming, my editors and I were brainstorming at the start of this year. And I said, look, let me do a one year anniversary piece. Let me go up to Shasta and start exploring what does the county look like a year after the recall election and a year after it sort of jagged to the far right. And so the editors, you know, knew it was a good story and they said, yes, you know, it's close enough to Sacramento that I could go back and forth quite often. So I spent a ton of time over several months just going back and forth to Shasta County and trying to get a handle on what was happening up there and what far right governance looked like and why it was so important, you know, what it signified for where we were as a country. So that's basically the the way I got into this story. Yeah. And I think that, I mean, and it came through loud and clear, but let's talk a bit about this for a moment. I mean, so Shasta County, which was in my youthful era, the home of where they grew some of the best marijuana in America, <laughs> um, as I remember it. And, but it, it has shifted it shifted very conservative, it always had that base, but this is beyond conservative. What, what you're covering here is, 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 the, is a literal takeover by the far right. Yeah, I mean, Shasta, if you go back 70 years or even 60 years, Shasta County was a reliably democratic county. It was conservative, but it had a timber industry, it had unionized workers. You know, it's, it's voters 100 years ago or 90 years ago supported the New Deal. It's voters in the early 1960s supported Lyndon Johnson. But by the 70s, like so much of rural America, it was veering rightward. And it's been reliably Republican for half a century at this point. So there's no surprise that it voted for Trump. There's no surprise that two out of every three voters in Shasta voted for Trump. But you're right. What's happened here is not just conservative or right wing government. It's uber right wing government. It's um, people who are out and out militia members or supporters. It's people who literally want every county employee to have to swear an oath to the Second Amendment. Um, You know, that sounds cartoonish, but it's literally on the um, program of these these guys. The Board of Supervisors wants you to have to swear an oath to the Second Amendment. 
um, they fired their county public health officer because he had the temerity to recommend things like mask mandates and um, to put in place ways to follow up on the state mandates around lockdowns and around school shutdowns and so on. Um, it's really irrationalist, conspiracist governance. Um, one of the big things is they got a lot of attention nationally a month or two back when they became the first county in the country to end their contract with Dominion voting machines. And so they now have no viable way to vote because by California law, you can't just have hand ballots. You have to have um, machine ballots, at least as part of your count process. But they don't anymore because they got rid of Dominion voting without anything to take its place. Um, so you're, you're right. This is not sort of anything recognizable as standard conservative governance. This is sort of MAGA squared. It, it's the sort of ultimate absurd endpoint of MAGA governance. I would I'd like to explore for a moment just, I mean, how they took over. Because you, you write in, the, in, in, in this article... Um, uh, about um, people like Matt Nimmo and the rants on KCNR, which we'll hear a little bit later when we talk to one of the folks who lives in Shasta County. Yeah, and and you you uh, write about the militia, the Cottonwood militia that was going to bring, as you quote, Cottonwood justice of vagrants, criminals, and other undesirables, said this one of the leaders, Carlos Zapata. So talk, I mean, so, I mean lay out for us how that happened. So, so... I'll, first of all, I'll lay out how it didn't happen. Okay. It was not a literal takeover by armed men. It was not a coup. It was not, I mean, the, the, the nation actually ran a headline saying California coup d'etat. I don't have anything to do with the headlines. You know, I, I write the story. <laughs> um, it, 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 was, it was an electoral takeover. It was a takeover by extremely right-wing people who had been activated first by Trump and then by COVID. And everybody I spoke to, left wing and right wing, conservative, liberal, everyone I spoke to said that you can't understand what happened in Shasta County in 21, 22 and 23 without understanding the COVID crisis. Because you had these lockdowns, you had these months and months where kids couldn't go to school, you had businesses being closed and you had growing public unease. And so in Michigan, you saw it with armed, armed men trying to take over the state capitol building or you saw it with the attempt to kidnap Gretchen Whitmer. Um, you saw it with Trump's ludicrous tweets about liberating various democratic controlled states. Well, in Shasta, the way it played out, you had um, border supervisors meetings. The border supervisors run the county. You had border supervisors meetings, which were basically taken over in 2020 and 2021 by far right organizers. And they were organizing, especially around the schools, but they were also organizing around mass mandates and then later against vaccine mandates. And they came out to these meetings and they were unmasked and they were unsocially spaced. And so anybody who sort of was thinking sensibly about the pandemic stopped showing up at these meetings. So they basically ceded the ground to these very far right, very angry organizers who would turn the board of supervisors meetings into an absolute spectacle, a sort of a sort of mini January 6th every time they held a board of supervisors meeting. And they organized and they went viral with some of their actions and some of their speeches. And they got a lot of attention um, from conservative um, talk radio, from television, conservative TV, like um, Tucker Carlson. Uh, some of their leaders ended up on the Alex Jones Infowars um, show and so on. And the more they got attention, the more their sort of echo chamber amplified on social media. And they eventually organized to recall three supervisors. They were all conservative, but they were moderate conservative. And so they held this recall election. One of the three got recalled. He was a man called Leonard Moti. And Leonard Moti had sort of particularly aroused the ire of these conservatives for various reasons. And he got recalled. It was about 56% voting in favor. In the year after the recall, the county just slid further and further to the right. So one by one by one, the moderate Republicans were replaced by extremely conservative Republicans. And so you now have a four to one majority on the board four extremists, one moderate. The moderate's a woman called Mary Wickert, who features quite prominently in my article. Um, and it wasn't just the county board of supervisors, it was the school boards. One by one, these small towns began electing really, really right-wing school boards who were first against the mask mandates, then against the vaccine mandates. And then it sort of morphed in 2023 to being against critical race theory and being against having the presence of um, gay and transgendered issues in the classroom. 
And all those culture wars that are playing out nationally that we see in Florida or we see in um, Virginia, all the, all these issues that have mobilized conservative voters are playing out in microcosm and amplified in Shasta County. Um, and I find it horrifying. But, I, you know, if I'm honest, I also find it absolutely fascinating to tell this story because it's such a bizarre political saga and it's such a cautionary tale of what could happen in one county after another after another if progressives don't learn to find a way to talk to rural America again. So let's talk about that for a moment. This, this, is what I, this is one of the points I wanted to get to in our conversation, which you've just raised, which is why is this so important? We're talking about one county in Northern California, uh, not far from the border of Oregon, that's been taken over by real right-wing fanatics. So why, is this, why, do you see, why do you think it's so important? It's so important because it's emblematic. If it was literally one anomalous county, well, then it would just be an interesting story, but it would be self-contained. But it's the fact that these guys are using a language that's spoken by national figures. It's spoken by Donald Trump. It's spoken, spoken by Marjorie Taylor Greene. It's spoken by Matt Gates. It's spoken by numerous political figures with a national platform. And these guys aren't marginal figures anymore. You can't just say, oh, well, there are a few eccentric people. They're very powerful within the Republican Party. And if you look at opinion polls, you know, They've got a shot at taking control of the country come 2024. So if you want to understand what's happening in this country, if you want to understand the degradation of the political process and the degradation of the political discussion, looking at Shasta County is a really, really good place to start because what you see in microcosm are all of these forces, all of these tensions around Trump, around COVID, around social media, around how to deal with public health mandates, around how to deal with schools. All of that is seen in microcosm in a place like Shasta. Um, and I've written about other, other areas too. A year ago, I did a story on a town called Squim on the Olympic Peninsula in Washington. It was a very similar story that has had this sort of slide rightward that was doing all kinds of dangerous things to the body politic locally and that had national implications. So, you know, I've, I've been a political journalist for 30 years at this point, and I love finding stories where you can tell a massive national or even an international story through zooming in on one community. And I think in Shasta, you really can do that. It's got all the ingredients to tell a bigger story. It, it does. And so one of the things that we need to focus on for a moment here is, is, is the ascent of Patrick Jones. Talk a bit about him and the takeover of this county, not just the takeover of the county, but what it is emblematic of or what could happen in this country. Because the way you describe it in the article, when the right wing took over the county, they fired people right and left. Uh, people were threatened. Their lives were threatened. It was almost a, even though they love to say they're against fascism, again, hate Nazis, it was a very fascistic kind of uh, po policies that they put in place. Yeah, so Patrick Jones, I mean, you're absolutely right. Pat Patrick Jones used to be a councillor in the town of Reading, and he's a gun store owner. His family's owned a gun, a gun store in um, Reading for about 50 years. And Patrick Jones is as conservative as you can get. He's firmly convinced that anyone to the left of Mitt Romney is a communist, and probably Mitt <laughs> Romney is a communist. Too. I mean, he's really, really right. Right, right, right. So, and, you know, when you talk with him, he... He says, you know, he doesn't believe in gay rights. He doesn't believe in the NAACP. I mean, just you, you hear these things. You think, well, you know, what does he believe in? Well, what he believes in is guns. And he'll tell you that up front. He's a Second Amendment absolutist. He's an extremely conservative, religious conservative. He believes in a sort of black and white morality. And this man is on the board of supervisors now. He got elected in 2020, I think, at the end of 2020. For a while, he was the lone far-right member. He was the one against four moderates. And then over the last year and a half, he's basically sort of come to dominate. So he's now the chair of the board. And he's the one who's pushing to get rid of Dominion voting machines. He's the one who's pushing for the Second Amendment oath. He's the one who's um, pushed mm -hmm. to fire the public health officer and various other um, civil servants in, in Shasta. And his mark is pretty profound. I mean, if you want to see a county being remade at speed, looking to the actions of someone like Patrick Jones gives you a pretty in good indication of what can happen when ideas of good governance are replaced by a really stridently ideological, conservative or radical right vision of what governance should be. Um, he's an interesting guy to talk to. I spent a lot of time talking to, his, to him in his gun store. He's very personable in person. You know, I sat with him for several hours. I talked with him. Um, he was very generous with his time. 
I just didn't agree with anything he was saying. And the longer he talked, the more what he was saying scared me. And it scared me because I think it's fundamentally irrationalist. And when you have governance that puts aside all expertise and basically shuns the idea of expertise, and when you have governance that fetishizes guns and weapons, and when you have governance that mocks public health officers, um, that to me is a recipe for chaos. And so, you know, again, if you want to understand what's happening nationally, look at figures like Patrick Jones or on the national stage, Marjorie Taylor Greene, and see what kind of vision they're promoting. So, I mean, the way you describe this is that you, with this kind of right-wing majority, first of all, you describe people in the council as moderate. Most people in the council, from what I've read, were fairly were conservative um, in a traditional American sense. And these folks who've taken over are further to the right than that. I mean... Yeah, I, I, I think that's true. And I think that's a story more of apathy than anything else. So county board of supervisors are very important at a local level, but very few people actually pay attention to those elections. So you can get elected with a few thousand votes, even in a county with, the, you know, I mean, Shasta's sparsely populated by California standards, but it still has 185,000 people. But you can get elected with just a few thousand votes if you're running to be one of the five county supervisors. Because a lot of people don't vote. And that that's you know particularly true in off-year elections when there's no presidential election or Senate race to bring people out to vote. But I think what happened in Shasta was you had a very, very well-organized right wing. And they'd organized around the um, issues of COVID. And they'd organized around trying to make the board meetings in person again when the board meetings went remote at the height of the COVID pandemic. So you had this core group of people and they organized very effectively. And, you know, frankly, they used grassroots techniques very effectively. They did the old fashioned thing of knocking on doors. They had um, petition gathering parties. They had fundraising parties at local restaurants and diners and gun stores and everywhere else. Um, they were very effective at organizing. But I don't think that that means that the entire bulk of Shasta County's electorate suddenly swung to the far right. I think if you talk to most people in Shasta County, they're where they've always been. They're moderately conservative. They're probably culturally more conservative than most parts of the country because, you know, they're a small rural state. But they're not fanatically right wing. And yet they are now being governed by fanatically right wing people. And to me, that you know, that's a real cautionary tale. What happens when people don't get involved at local politics? Well, the time that we have, let's talk a bit about this cautionary tale, because what, what, what you described in the article, the right wing won a majority of the votes in all these elections. You describe people actually go door to door uh, in a very intimidating way, demanding to know how people voted and firing the county attorney, firing the public health officer. And so, I mean, it's, it's a cautionary tale about fascism and how it can grow. But you say most of the county is not right wing, yet they voted majority for this far right wing. Oh, no, I didn't, I, did, I didn't say they're not right wing. I said they're not as right wing as the um, people who are now representing them. Um, the people who voted are probably that right wing. Um, as I said, you know, one of the issues in understanding stories like this is understanding apathy, who votes, who doesn't vote, who's more mobilized, who's not mobilized, who's organized, who's not organized. And these right wing groups did a very, very good job of mobilizing their base. In, in the same way as when you look at these um, book banning movements that are taking off around the country at the moment, you know, frankly, I don't think the majority of Americans are really up in arms about the fact that there are gay themed books or transgender themed books in schools and libraries. But there are these really well organized evangelical voices who are up in arms about it. And, you know, oftentimes in politics, the people who shout loudest get the most attention. Well, the right wing, the far right wing in Shasta County spent three years shouting louder than anybody else. And you know, they drove a lot of other people away from the political process. People stopped, you know, people who weren't right wing stopped attending board meetings. They stopped um, engaging. I think they felt intimidated. There was a lot of, you know, violent rhetoric floating around on social media. And so the people who were left on the political stage were the right wing and the irrationalist. Um, and, you know, when you when you look at how authoritarian movements arise, Oftentimes, that's how they arise. They arise because there's an organized minority of voters, but they're well enough organized that they can start to dominate the electoral process. And once that happens, and once those groups get footholds in power, they're very, very hard to dislodge. 
because then they have all the propaganda tools at their disposal. They have patronage tools at their disposal. They have all the powers of governance at their disposal. You saw this in Turkey last week with um, President Erdogan. Well, you know, if anybody deserves not to have been reelected, it was somebody <laughs> who provided over, you know, <laughs> hyperinflation and shoddy construction that led to tens of thousands of people dying in an earthquake. Right. Well, Erdogan was reelected because he controlled the state media and he controlled the propaganda apparatus. Um, same thing in Hungary with Viktor Orban. Um, same thing in Russia with Vladimir Putin. Um, it's very, very dangerous to let authoritarians get power because once they have it, it's very hard to um, reclaim power from them. And what you're saying here is that Shasta County and the right-wing takeover of Shasta County is an object lesson for America. Absolutely. That, you know, if, if good people don't get engaged enough, bad actors can end up with too much power. Um, and that is a cautionary tale. We saw it in 2015 with the rise of Donald Trump, 2015, 2016. Um, we're certainly not past that authoritarian moment. If anything, we're right in the middle of it still. That, you know, all of the... <laughs> All of the movements spawned by Trumpism are now playing out locally. And it may be a bit frag more fragmented than it was when Trump was president. But that movement toward using power in a really nefarious way, that's alive and well. And we're certainly seeing it in Shasta County and in the hiring and firing decisions that are being made by Shasta County supervisors right now. Well, yeah, Sasha Abrams, this article is um, an eye-opener. It's important for people to understand and read, but of course we'll, people can read it and attach it. We're about to talk to one of the folks that you interviewed there uh, right after we, right after this, uh, to Donnie Chamberlain. So it, it's, to talk, as we part today, to talk a bit about her, uh, why you interviewed her, uh, and what she represents. Well, I'll let her speak for herself. No, no, she so will. Like, don't worry. She, I, I don't put words yeah, in the no, I mean, yeah. you know, In brief, Don, Donnie Chamberlain's a local journalist. He runs an, an online news, or, news site called A News Cafe. And she has been following local politics for many, many, many years and has been chronicling with growing horror what's been happening at the county board of supervisors level. So she was you know, very important when I was doing the story because she had a lot of information. So I would go and I'd interview her many times. Um, but, you know, she, she'll, she'll tell you exactly you know, who she is and why, why she's there and everything else. Um, but, you know, she's an interesting person to talk to. Well, Sasha, I really appreciate this piece of work you've done uh, and the work you're doing, and I look forward to many more conversations, and thanks for bringing this to all of our attention. Well, again, Mark, thank you, and I always enjoy being on your show. It's a pleasure. And now we're going to hear from Donnie Chamberlain, who grew up in Shasta County. She's the founder and editor of thenewscafe.com. When she's not writing about food, she takes on the right wing, the racism and the danger of the right wing in her community. And as we hear in these clips... She puts her life on the line to stand up to the bully boys of the right. You live in a country of 300 million people, 300 million armed people. Do you really think the veterans that are being driven out of the military are in watching their families destroyed over this COVID crap? You know, people like Donnie Chamberlain should be tried under the Nuremberg trial and then publicly executed because of what they're doing. Our children do not deserve what they've gone over the last two years. They have done nothing to deserve the restrictions and mandates, the stress, the horrifying trauma that they're having to endure by having to cover their faces, by having to go to school, by having to watch their parents stress out. This is the nexus that we're facing right now of stressors in our life, and they do not deserve any bit of it. And when you have people like Donnie Chamberlain who is the only person in this room right now wearing a mask covering her coward face. <laughs> Telling lies about me, about my family, about my friends, contacting my ex-wife, the mother of my children, trying to get her to say things about me. How'd that work out for you, Donnie? Tell me, you wanna speak here? The microphone's yours. The very man that you have been writing about, well, I don't know what you would do with your life if it wasn't for me, Donnie Chamberlain. The one man that you write about the most, and you don't have the stones, the courage, the moral fortitude to interview me one time. Have you ever reached out to me and sat down for an interview? I have offered that to you many times, Donnie, but you and your coward photographer, your coward little staff that you have, your 25 followers that read your bullshit little articles. Yeah, coward. You are a coward, Donnie Chamberlain. Yeah. It's people like you that are making this life difficult for our children, for people that actually want to live in this county and make it better. 
Look at my eyes, darling, because I'm speaking to you. And Donna Chamberlain, welcome to the show. Good to have you with us. So what we just heard here was, it was Matt Nimmo on a local radio station and Carlos Zapata at a supervisor's meeting kind of attacking you. Mm-hmm. So, to, I, so I wanted to play that up front because I, I want to get a sense of people who are listening to get a sense of the tension and the forces arrayed against you that are really quite threatening in a very personal way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I've been a journalist for 30 years and I always was under the mistaken impression that somehow if I waded into a meeting or a protest or anything, somehow my little notebook and pen and recording device would protect me. But in the <laughs> last three years, um, when I go out in public to these places, protests or whatever, I've had people turn their attention on to me and um, verbally attack me, call me names, uh, I mean, names that I couldn't say or the FCC would come down on you, you know. Um, <laughs> uh, so it's been pretty scary. And um, I, uh, I've had, I have, my son has put security devices all around my house. And I'm very careful when I go out in public. I, I'm, uh, I'm not paranoid, but I'm very careful and watchful. And Matt Nimmo eventually did actually just recently, he's suing me and a news cafe and RV Scheid for defamation. <laughs> Hmm. Which I laugh because he's accusing us of saying something to defame his character when all we did was write about the death threats that he, you know, he's recommending I am tried in the Nuremberg trial like situation and I'm publicly hanged and the way communists and socialists put that in air quotes like me understand is to be dragged behind a car and have my neck stretched, things like that. So he is attempting to sue us, and I've never been sued. I'm always very careful. I tell the reporters who work for us, let's make this a week when we don't get sued. So right. far, so good. Knock on wood. You know, <laughs> and as you know, the uh, defense for um, libel or slander or defamation is truth, right? So as long as you speak the truth. But anyway, we are countersuing, which I have never done. So um, we'll see. Our hearing is on the 26th. Never, I never thought as a journalist I would have to be afraid uh, to report. And it's not just, I'm afraid, but I keep on doing what I'm doing because I'm driven and I'm terrier like. And, um, but what I'm finding is it's, it's almost impossible to find people to speak with me, even as a confidential source who I promise I would never disclose their identity. Mm -hmm. People are afraid to speak even off the record. So we hear these things whispered to us, you know, we get tips and, um, and we we can't go any further with it because we cannot substantiate it with the very people who are in the position of knowing. So it's it's pretty awful. Well, I I might take a step back for a moment because they, mm-hmm. uh, talk a bit about the county itself. I mean, you grew yeah. up in Northern California. I did. Um, and it's always been in the state of California, in, in some ways, a more conservative spot space than other parts of the state. Yes. All right. But something is is afoot here. It's gotten to a point where, where, where with places like Shasta, where you live, that kind of has a lesson f- for the entire country to listen to. Yes. Right? Yes, absolutely. Well, you know, that's what Carlos Zapata said from day one is this is a blueprint. They have a blueprint for the extremists. And this is way beyond Republican, Democrat party politics. This is way beyond. This is regarding, this is rational versus irrational sane versus insane i mean and the other side when they don't get their way when they don't like what's happening they will threaten people you know threaten to be hang them or we know where you live we know where your dog lives we know everything about you um i've had death threats mary rickert who's one of the sanest people on the board right now. She's had death threats. We've reported it, of course, and nothing ever happens. So that's the blueprint. And these guys, I think, genuinely want to go kind of scorched earth on Shasta County. They don't care if the county, you know, devolves in, into a cesspool of nothingness. I'm, I mean, um, that's the way it appears now. You have a, a majority on the board who are just slashing and burning and Kevin Cry is bringing in Mike Lindell and all these outside insane people who, who have been, um, you know, denounced and, uh, you know, 
it doesn't matter. So I think some people think, and I'm not sure if I would go this far, but a lot of people say they think there's some outside source, outside something that is using Shasta County as an example for the rest of the country. We're the little Petri dish. We're a hard right, extremely conservative group of people already, but we're surrounded, you know, we're in a sea of blue in, here in California. And um, I think we're being made an example of, and the other side, the militia, all those guys say, hey, people are watching us. And they say that like smiling, like way to go, because that means that the people who want to come here are people who think like them and who threaten and, uh, you know, want open carry and, uh, you know, so, so basically those people want this place, Shasta County, to be even more populated with even more extreme conservatives. So, but you, you mentioned Mary Rickard. Now, Mary yeah. Rickard it was, on the, it was on the Board of Supervisors. Yes, yeah, she, right? still she still she's, is. They, yeah, they'd love to have her out, but she's still there. And she describes herself as a Reagan Republican. Yes, absolutely. Right? And yeah. she says, she's from what Sasha wrote, I mean, she said that, that um, she suffers from PTSD. Um, yeah, yeah. And and that and 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 and, uh, and watching her home being taken over by these kind of very far right group. So I mean, it sounds as if everything I've read and people I've talked to, that it's almost like what you're facing is living under the beginnings of a, um, for one of a better term, I don't like using these words loosely, mm -hmm. but, uh, but like a neo-fascist dictatorship. Hey, I was thinking, I was thinking that term as you were before you spoke. That's exactly what it feels like, and. Don't forget, a lot of the problems that are happening are happening directly from our elected leaders on the board with Mary Rickert. I look at it like a pirate ship. You know, Shasta County was the ship just kind of going along, mainly <laughs> conservative. And it's been taken over by these crazy pirates who are just, you know, take no prisoners. And they are so rude to Mary during meetings. I mean, it's appalling. People just gasp. These guys gaslight her. They mock her right during meetings. Uh, Patrick Jones and Kevin Cry in particular, um, very disrespectful. And she just hangs in there. She's stubborn. And she is one of these people. Now, Kevin Cry talks about how God has led him to do great things. Mary Rickert, I believe, is the real McCoy. I'm not a religious person. I'm a Democrat. <laughs> Mary Rickert is a, a conservative Catholic. Um, and she and I, it, it amazes me that we can have the kind of conversations we do because we are so different in many ways. But I look at her like, kind of like Joan of Arc or something. I mean, she is standing strong there. And she says that what keeps her going is her faith. Um, uh, and she's staying in there as long as possible. Kathy Darling Allen, our registrar of voters, is in the same boat. She's a Democrat. And it's a nonpartisan party um, um, position, so it shouldn't matter. So are the supervisors, for that matter. But these two women in particular, um, they are not extremist people. They're, in fact, Kathy Darling Allen will sometimes knit furiously during some of the most raucous board meetings as for a <laughs> stress buster, you know. They're just <laughs> strong women pushing back and saying, we do, it sounds corny, but they do love this county. So talk a bit about where you think the roots of this, are. before we talk about where you think it may go, mm. what the roots of this are. I mean, as we said earlier, th th that part of California you're in has always been a more conservative region, though it's always been mixed, but it's never had that kind of s sense of fear that people have to live under. No. Of, of threat of being killed, of bodily harm. No. What, what do you think changed? Well, President Trump influenced uh, things greatly here. Many, many people voted for President Trump, including Mary Rickert, at least the first time. Okay. And then I think um, when I was a kid growing up in the 60s, uh, Shasta County was actually Democrat. We had lumber mills and union jobs. And so it was more Democrat. And then so it you eventually- So you grew up in Shasta County? Yeah, I did. I've been okay. here since I was five years old. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Right, yeah. Right, right. So, but you know, my mom was a New Yorker and always hated Shasta County. And so that kind of <laughs> leaked over. She used to say only mad dogs and Englishmen would be in this place in the summer. And I have to agree with her. But anyway, um, I think it was sort of the perfect storm. You had Trump and a lot of people here who believe in him and follow him no matter what he does. And then COVID came. And in the beginning, like Carlos's first speech, where he gave his speech that went viral and made him kind of a minor celebrity, was about, hey, 
we're not taking this anymore. You're not going to mask our kids. Well, guess what? In Shasta County, there was not one citation written by the health department, not one. Our health officer, who they eventually ran out on a rail, Karen Ramstrom, she's gone. Um, she tried the best she could to basically keep people safe during a pandemic, but not one citation. She didn't force anyone to wear a mask. But I think this group, it was like they were waiting in the wings for the trigger to be pulled to basically open the floodgates for their moment to scream about the one thing I think they all have in common because it's a disparate group. Some are religious, some are militias, some are, you know, they're all over the place, state of Jefferson. What they all have in common is the desire uh, for, they call it freedom, to do whatever they want, whatever it is, to open carry, to not have a building permit, to, so, and they, speak about this time that I don't know ever existed in history. It's like take back America, right? Make America great. Mm -hmm. They, they talk about this kind of old timey, you know, American, American values. And by the way, a lot of them talk, like I just talked a lot of people who speak with this kind of faux kind of country accent like that. They've never left Shasta County. I don't know where this accent comes from, <laughs> but uh, some of them are from Turlock and Merced and, you know, you know, the Bay Area, but they get here and they start talking and walking like that and they dress like that and they have chew in their back pocket and you can see the outline <laughs> of their gun. I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. It's like a costume. So I think I think COVID kind of gave the excuse why they were upset, but I don't think it was about COVID because nothing was happening here. Restaurants blatantly stayed open, bars. In fact, you'll hear some people like the Chamber of Commerce say, you know what? Shasta County has the distinction of being the most economically stable county in California during the pandemic. You know why? Because nobody closed. They kept doing business. They didn't, there were, the people who complied by and large were ethnic restaurants, Thai restaurants, Mexican restaurants, because they were doing what the state said. But I mean, but not to get too deep into this part, but, but what you described here though, from what I've read and what Sasha wrote about is you have this county of 185,000 residents. Right. There were mm -hmm. almost 700 people died from COVID. Yeah. Because right. there were no restrictions at all. And right. that, it was a, there was a higher percentage than the whole state of California in terms of yeah. deaths from That's right. That's right. But COVID's fake, you know. That's what they'll say. It's just the flu. The ignorance is astounding. Absolutely astounding. And now in Shasta County, we have no health officer. We have an old, old guy, an ancient guy in there just trying to, you know, put his finger in the dike to keep things from falling apart. But we now have one of the highest sexually transmitted disease rates in the state. We now have seepage from a canal. It's called the ACID Canal, Anderson Cottonwood Irrigation District. And it's because of the drought and being empty. Now, water is seeping into sewer lines. It's a huge health risk, bacteria, people, and all those true health concerns, homelessness, um, overdoses, none of those are being addressed because we don't have a health officer. So, um, I bet this other group says we don't, we don't need no stinking health officer. What, what, is, what, is, what is what you're going through in Shasta County every day and people who are around you. I mean, I've seen the, the photos of people in, in meetings who oppose what's going on, but they're clearly, a, they're a large minority, but they're a minority of the people um, in, in Shasta, at least it appears that way. Um, what, is that, what does that portend, do you think, for the rest of the country? What does it say about where we could be headed? Well, if Shasta County is, air quote, successful, if these, this group, I mean, they're taking over school boards, it's that pirate thing, climbing onto ships, any elected position, getting on the board of supervisors. And, you know, now we've dumped, they've dumped our Dominion voting machine, which has disenfranchised 111,000 registered voters in Shasta County. It's unprecedented that any place in the country has ever done a hand count of this magnitude. Um, I interviewed a woman who's like a elections expert, and she said, most of the time across the country, you'll have hand counts in little places in, in New England or Alaska or someplace or uh, tiny places, little municipalities that have a couple of hundred people or a couple of thousand at most. The very top one, I think, was 16,000 somewhere. Um, Shasta County has 111,000. How can you hand count um, a ballot that has multiple 
races on it, I think it's going to crash and burn, which means that even if people want to vote and they rush and they say, I want to vote, if you can't count the votes, it, it breaks the system. And these guys have done no planning. I mean, Mike Lindell spoke directly with our Kevin Cry, who's under threat of being recalled now. And frankly, as a journalist, you know, that whole thing where the, the both sideism of journalism, mm -hmm. this person says this, what does this person say? For me, the stakes are so high here that that objectivity has gone out the window. I am openly saying when I write, Kevin Cry lies, <laughs> Kevin Cry cheats. Those are pretty strong words, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I'm calling it as it is, like it is imperative that this man is recalled because he has brought nothing but chaos and um, destruction to Shasta County. And that sounds like such hyperbole, but I'm not exaggerating. So, I mean, when, when you hear those th threats that take place against you and some others, how seriously do you take them and how dangerous do you think it really is? I take it seriously enough that I'm considering for the first time in my life um, getting a concealed weapon permit. I hate guns. Uh, I just called today to get a bid on a security gate on my front my front driveway. Um, I, I'm very guarded without letting people know where I live, but like this lawsuit, this Matt Nimmo guy, he had no trouble finding out where I lived and he now knows where I live because I received his, the court papers. I take it seriously, not so much for somebody like Matt Nimmo or even Carl Carlos Zapata, but the people who listen to them. The guy, the disenfranchised, unemployed guy in a single wide trailer with a bare light bulb in his dirty underwear who feel inspired to do something about someone like me, who, who they classify as a communist socialist who needs to be shown a lesson. Um, and so I do take it seriously. I try not to talk about it. I have a twin sister. She, if I get a death threat, I don't even tell her what it is because she literally will cover her ears and say, I can't, I can't listen to this. I can't stand it. Um, so there are just few of us who can speak among ourselves, um, who have been, who are under that kind of pressure. It's a very, it's a small club and it's a scary, it's a scary place to be. For example, I live in an old house. I'm sitting here, I can see out my window, and um, I moved my bedroom. I had a lovely bedroom right at the front of the house, but at some point I would lie in bed at night and think, if somebody drove by with an AK-47 and shot the windows out, I wonder I wonder if they would hit me while I'm sleeping. So I've moved my room, and now my office is in the front, and during the day I can watch everything from my little catbird seat. So I've made, I'm not going to, turn into an agoraphobic person who never goes out, but I take it seriously enough that I know that things can happen. We have the highest percentage per capita of concealed weapons in the state. And that's not counting the people like one of our board supervisors, Chris Kellstrom, who says it's his God-given right to carry a weapon and he doesn't need a permit. So we already have the concealed weapon permit, you know, largest number, and those are the legally carrying people. And I have no clue how many other people are carrying weapons without a permit. And that's frightening. They're loaded weapons. Woody Clenenden, the militia, head of the militia here said in some interview, I think it was the LA Times said, the only time he's not carrying a loaded weapon is when he's in the shower. And I think that's the way a lot of these guys feel. This is the gun and store then, owner. Uh, no, that's uh, Patrick Jones, who's our supervisor. He's your supervisor, that's right, that's right. right yeah, right, yeah, right, yeah, right, yeah. Right, right, right. All these characters. Having read, read what's going on in Shasta County, because I, it's always been a place where there are a lot of conservatives, but yeah. others as well. Yeah. They lived in relative harmony over the decades. Mm. Yeah, sure. Um, and and this kind of shows where we're going from January 6th to what's happening to you in Shasta County. And and it, I think it's a, it's an important lesson for, for everybody to listen to just in terms of what could be coming because it's not necessarily limited to Shasta County. No, and I think we are an example. We are that blueprint. I mean... Um, I'd like to think there's another blueprint, the other side of where people are standing up finally. They're the people who were kind of hanging out on the beach with their picnic baskets, just regular citizens. And they said, I'm not into politics and I don't want to get involved. And it's now they're standing up and they're trying to recall Kevin Cry, Leonard Modi, who was recalled in a dirty, nasty uh, 
lie-based recall, he has often said that the only way the average citizen will actually stand up and pay attention is when their garbage is no longer picked up. Mm. It has to be personal on that level. Mm -hmm. I mean, seriously. So, but I think other places in the country are watching. And if these guys, if the pirates can take over the ship and turn it around and, you know, head us for an iceberg or whatever metaphors you want to use, uh, sink us, whatever, I think they will emulate us. And also, like in the example with the Dominion machines, Kevin Cry is speaking in different counties in California, encouraging other counties to do the same thing, even though it's untested here. So it's kind of like the Pied Piper saying, hey, you guys, follow us without knowing where the cliff is. You know, um, it's untested. For, it's un I know I'm totally mixing my metaphors. Uncharted waters, cliffs, whatever. <laughs> Garbage disposal, sinkholes. Gotcha. Holes. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> it's all bad. <laughs> and I, I think that we'll just conclude here with this is also, we talked a little bit about this with Sasha, but it, it it's also is built around this whole political ideology of creating a separate state. Yeah. Oh, yeah. In Oregon and North Cal uh, in, in Northern California, they want to call it the state of Jefferson. Not only that, they're, now it's like, it's like putting two Japanese fighting fish in the same little bowl, right? We have the state of Jefferson, folks. That's one group. And then we have the new California state group and these are two different organizations they don't even like each other and they want to split up the state in different pieces in a different way so i kind of feel like we should just stand back and let those guys duke it out you know but yeah that's another thing the time you hear this refrain the time has come for 51 the time has come for 51 51st state so um i i cannot believe what's happening here um it's just, and I don't know if you heard about this latest board meeting where we had the speaker who used the N-word. The N-word. Against, uh, against a black man who was trying to speak up. He was staring right at the only black person. We, you know, we're a sea of white here in Shasta County. Uh, the only African-American person in the audience, this guy turned and looked right at him. And then Patrick Jones, the chair, threw out the African-American gentleman, Nathan Blaze Pinckney, threw him out for yelling in the audience saying, hey, he told the guy to get out, call him a racist. So the wrong person was thrown out of the room. And now our supervisors are considering whether to do a code of conduct that says that the N-word should not be speaking, spoken in a board meeting. I mean, whoa. Yeah, whoa. That's how far we've devolved here, you know. Open racism. They, 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 even, they even try to hide it better in places like Mississippi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's just mind boggling. And so a lot of people are leaving this area. And um, I'm just stubborn enough that I'm hanging in here. Because I feel like I have, I have a huge job. And um, I'll just keep going until I can return to one day writing about recipes and stuff and feature stories about cool people, you know. Well, I, I will say this in, in a, jokingly, but then seriously, I, I've, I looked all through your site. Your recipes look great, so I'm going to try some. Of them. <laughs> they are. I, well, you know, that's what I do for my therapy. You should see my freezer. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, but I do want to say that, that we'll be connecting to all your work uh, here on our site. People can see what you're talking about. Thank you. Look at which, where where you are. We'll. I will stay in touch. Um, Thank you. And I know you're in a very dangerous situation. Um, and I it's, it, and it, and it says a lot about the power of the extreme right in this country that have taken over several states and what they're doing where you live in Shasta County. Yeah. And so, yeah. I, Don and Chamberlain, please stay safe. We'll stay I will in do touch. my best. <laughs> okay. Please do, and we'll stay in touch. And we'll thank you so much for taking your time with us. Yeah, and visit Shasta County anytime. I'll show you around, okay? <laughs> it's, been a, it's been a while. I'm ready to come back. It's, be it's a beautiful county. <laughs> it is. That's what they say. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye-bye. I want to thank our guests today, Sasha Abramsky and Donnie Chamberlain, for joining us. And I want to thank you all for listening. We face a grave danger in this country. What's happening in Shasta County, California, is emblematic of what's happening in counties and municipalities and states around the country. We're in a battle for our future and for the future generations to come. Now, I, we're going to keep doing this and stay on this because this is one of the most important topics, I think, facing our future. So please write to me at mss at therealnews.com. I want to hear your thoughts, your ideas, stories you might want us to cover. You know, we're in this together. I'm here to highlight what your communities face and how we organize to stand together. So remember, MSS 
at therealness.com, and I'll write you right back. So for David Hebden and Kayla Rivara and the crew here at The Real News, I'm Mark Steiner. Take care, stay involved, keep listening, and stay in touch. Thank you so much for watching The Real News Network, where we lift up the voices, stories, and struggles that you care about most. And we need your help to keep doing this work. So please, tap your screen now, subscribe, and donate to The Real News Network. Solidarity forever.